obviously vampires are corpses. So why are we making them sexy all the time? Hi there, my name is Catherine. I hope you're doing well. Today's my March reading wrap up and it was the best reading month I've had in a long time. The best reading month I've had in 2024 by far and possibly the best reading month I've had since I started this channel. We got two five star reads and quite a few four, 4.5, 4.75 stars as well. In fact, should I figure out the average? How do you figure out an average? Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> So I read nine books in March and my average rating was 4.17, which is so high for me. To give you an idea, my average rating for 2023 as a whole was 3.33 stars. But anyway, I have so many good books that I'm so excited to talk about, so let's get into it. I started off March by reading Boy Parts by Eliza Clark, which I gave five stars to. Boy Parts is a kind of dark, satirical comedy following a woman from Newcastle who's a photographer who specialises in fetish photography. She likes to photograph men who are quite normal looking who she scouts on the streets of Newcastle and we basically spend the book with this character who is not a very nice character to be with. She is very unhinged, she has a lot of problems mentally which is kind of a constant consequence of, of trauma that she's experienced. We see her as she is preparing for this gallery event that she has gotten in London and as she gets closer to this amazing opportunity she just starts self-destructing and kind of tail spinning into this endless psychotic mindset in which she's doing crazy things which are negatively affecting her friendships, her relationships, her work. And let me tell you, I read this book in a day, I'm pretty sure. It was so fast paced, I couldn't put the book down, literally. And when I say that this book is a dark comedy, I really truly mean it because there are some aspects of this book which are so horrific. There's one in particular near the end of the book that was really horrifying to read something that our character does and it really really disturbed me and upset me but at the same time I couldn't stop reading and at the same time the book was <coughs> written in such a comedic way like there's there's a couple of references to Timothy Chalamet throughout the book and at one point he's referred to as a white baguette which as a Timothy Chalamet stan I thought was hilarious. If you've ever read American Psycho it's kind of like American Psycho but through the female gaze. It's got the kind of disturbing grittiness of American Psycho but the protagonist is a woman and so everything that she does in the book is kind of like an entirely different lens to how you read American Psycho. I think there would be so much to unpack in a uh, compare and contrast with the two books and the two characters. I just loved it so much. It was funny, horrific, disturbing and Eliza Clark's writing style is just so immersive. I loved it so much that I went straight on and I picked up Penance. This is Eliza Clark's other published book. She published this in 2023 and I think I loved this book even more than I loved Boy Parts. This was a five star for me as well and in this book we're following a morally grey journalist. It's alluded to that he has had some trouble in the past with how he portrays the truth as a journalist but we are put in the place of him as our protagonist and he is writing a book on a really famous murder case in a small town called crow on sea where a girl was horrifically tortured and burned to death by three other teenagers and the book is written as if it is an actual true crime that happened and i think i did look into it and i think this was kind of loosely based on a crime that happened in america which is so interesting because i think eliza clark's whole point of this book is to critique true crime and how we consume true crime but she is doing that by taking influence from a real true crime that did happen so then is it kind of negating the point <laughs> would it have been better if she had like made up a completely fictional crime i don't know or maybe that was the point to make us even more critical 
about the book. The, the book is split up into sections which focus on a specific girl who's involved in the crime, starting with the victim and then going through the three girls who allegedly committed the murder. One, it's a really good true crime thriller. I really enjoyed reading it for what it was, but then it's got that added layer on top of it that I was, which I was saying that it, it is truly like a critique on how we are consuming true crime and kind of the ethics behind that. So while you're reading it and while you're enjoying it, at the back of your mind you're constantly being like, should I be enjoying this? Because this is a horrible thing that happened. And it makes you think of like real life murders that you may have listened to a podcast about or watched a YouTuber do a makeup tutorial where they tell you about it and kind of the ethical way we're consuming stories like this and what it does to victims' families, whether it's become more of a money-grabbing empire. Like, if you really look at it, it's really crazy that true crime is a genre that we consume when this is actually people's lives and that really happened. As you can tell, this book made me think. <laughs> the ending of this book is incredible as well at kind of hammering that point home. And if you like thrillers and or are interested in true crime, I think you definitely should read this. I think it is so, so interesting and I highly recommend it. Next book I read was Swift and Saddled by Lila Sage and we're still riding that high because this was 4.75 stars and honestly, on a different day, in a different mood, I might have given it five stars. I'm honestly looking at this now and I am like, why didn't I give it five stars? I think I might reread it and I might bump it up. This was one of the best romances I've read in so long. I don't know if it's because I just read it at the right time, I was in the right mood, but there was something in this book. First of all, can I just say the cover of this book is everything to me. This is the second in a series of books set in the same universe, the Rebel Blue Ranch series. So I read the first one done and dusted last month and I did like it, but it was nothing really special to me. So the fact that I like fell so hard for this one was kind of like a bit of a shock. But anyway, yeah, the covers of these books, I definitely want to get physical copies of these because I love the kind of like comic-y, pop arty vibe of them. It kind of just matches the cowboy feel for me. This is a cowboy romance. I want physical copies so I can look at them all the time. So this is a city girl goes to a small town meets cowboy romance. Our main girl is Ada Hart who is a interior designer businesswoman who is trying to get on top of her life following a really short-lived not very good marriage and she finds herself in Meadowlark, our town where Rebel Blue Ranch is because she is going to be working on interior designing a new project on the ranch where they're turning the this old building into a guest house basically so they can have holidaymakers come and stay on the ranch. Our guy that she ends up falling in love with, <laughs> spoiler alert, is Weston Ryder who is the youngest brother on the ranch who we met in the previous book and he's just a very happy lovely guy on the surface but he does deal with depression and takes medication for depression and he is basically trying to prove himself on this ranch. His older brother Gus kind of has taken on the role of management on the farm because he's the oldest. His sister, who is the main character of the previous book, is in charge of horse riding classes and that's kind of like her area of expertise and Weston has always kind of felt like he doesn't have his own thing on the ranch so this guest house is a real passion project for him and it's something that is going to be his solely. When Ada arrives at Meadowlark she goes to the local bar on the first night to use some wi-fi and ends up meeting Weston but they don't realise who each other are and they have a really steamy kiss there because the attraction is real and it isn't until the next day that they realise that they will be working together that Weston is effectively her employer. They agree that they can't do anything with the feelings that they have for each other because it has to maintain a professional environment. I think the reason I love this book so much is these two characters 
I love them both so much separately and together. The relationship vibe is definitely like black cat golden retriever energy if you know what I mean. Ada is quite a loner, she doesn't open up to people very easily. Appearance wise she's really like cool, short black hair, she's got a sleeve of tattoos. And then Weston is completely just like golden retriever happy small town cowboy friendly guy, handsome of course. I think honestly the reason I like this book so much is probably because I fancy both of these characters so much. I really bought the conflict that was keeping them apart and that like came to a head during the climax of the book. It didn't feel forced, it felt authentic to their characters and I thought the steam in this book was absolutely giving. It was just chef's kiss. The next book I read was The No Girlfriend Rule by Kristen Randall. This is a young adult romance novel centred around Dungeons and Dragons and it basically follows a girl named Hollis Beckwith who struggles with anxiety and is coming to the end of high school and in a desperate attempt to kind of bond with her boyfriend she joins an all-girls group that plays secret and sorcery which is Dungeons and Dragons in this world because her boyfriend is obsessed with secrets and sorcery, plays it with his friends all the time but they have a no girlfriend rule so Hollis isn't allowed to play with them. So Hollis goes out and finds her own group of friends and the book's basically all about her just overcoming her anxiety, finding her people, learning how to stand up for herself, how to stand up for her friends as well as kind of beginning to explore her sexuality because in her Secrets and Sorceries group there is a girl called Amy who is playing a bard in their game and this bard and Hollis's character start flirting with each other but then Hollis is kind of unsure whether they are flirting with each other in real life as well and what their friendship is developing into and it was a really sweet concept and I really was excited to read this book but it didn't quite give me what I wanted from it so I rated this 2.75 stars. I really appreciated what the book was doing and the messages of the book. The issue for me was there was quite a lot of time spent in game. The time spent in game didn't actually add anything to the main plot of the story for me and it is quite a, a big driving part of the story so I feel like it should have been more engaging for me to read. I really like Dungeons and Dragons, I really like watching Critical Role and Dimension 20 and stuff like that so I feel like I should have found all of those passages of in-game really engaging but instead I just find them a bit dull and so that really brought the book down for me because so much time is spent in there. I was disappointed, I really really was excited to read this and I really, I still love the concept of it and I still love what the book is saying but it just wasn't engaging enough for me and that could well be because it is YA. I think some YA is really accessible to adults and can be enjoyed by adults but then some YA is very much more aimed towards young adults which is absolutely fine and that might just be the case for this that this wasn't written for me and that's fine. The next book I read was A Little Life by Anya Yanagihara and I gave this book 4.5 stars. We're back, we're back baby. This was excellent. I love this so much and I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. Everyone talks about this book, about how heart-wrenching it is how devastating it is and it has been on my shelf for a whole year basically and I just never knew when the right time to pick it up was so I made a little TikTok just saying that I was like when is the right time to read this because summertime is like a happy time right and you you want to read light like cute books that give you those vibes and I don't think this is that but then you get to autumn winter and the weather's like turning and getting cold so you want to read like more cozy books and you don't want to like fall into seasonal depression which I think this book would do so I put a tiktok out and I was like when would should I read this and the comments I got on that tiktok were split 
50 50 between people being like just read it now like you won't regret it this is my favorite book of all time i love this book blah blah blah, blah. and then other people being like burn it never read throw it out your window bin it don't read it don't do it and so i went in not knowing how I was going to feel about it but I got a lovely, a lovely comment on that short from Sharon who was in the same boat as me and it had been sitting on their shelf and they just were never picking it up and they suggested we do a buddy read together so we set that up on Storygraph and we set it up so we could like just go through it really slowly at our own paces no pressure and we can just put comments in and we set like the end date for six months from now because I thought this was going to be a book that I would have to like pick up and put down constantly, constantly and like really take my time with it. But I devoured this. This is a big, big book. So it did take me, I think it took me maybe just under a week to read it all. But it was all I read. Like I didn't, I didn't read anything else every time I had a spare minute to read. It was this book. This book follows four guys who live in New York and their lives basically and it's got a specific focus on one of these guys called Jude who has had a really horrific time of it to say the least but his friends don't really know what has happened to him because he won't tell anyone. They just know that he has no family and that he has been in an accident which makes it really difficult for him to walk. He is constantly going to see his doctor and it's just like an ongoing health issue for him but they don't know what happened to him to cause it, he won't tell. And the whole book is kind of like showing their lives throughout, I'd say like a span of maybe 30, 40 years, maybe more, as well as showing glimpses of Jude's past throughout. And it is was some of the most difficult stuff I had ever read, definitely. I struggle with descriptions of like graphic self-harm and that does happen quite a lot in this book. But I found that these descriptions were short and I could tell when they were coming up and I could really easily skim over that. And I think that's that's okay to do. Like if you want to read a book, but you know that it's going to be triggering for you in some ways, I would say don't go near it. But if you want to read a book that you know has triggers in it that you're kind of unsure about. I found that with this one, with that specific thing, I could skim over it and it was okay for me to do. Obviously, I'm not saying that it will be for you. It's definitely something that like you need to treat with on a case by case basis. But I will say like the amount of people who, who kind of disparage this book as torture porn or whatever, I do see that point and I think that is completely fair and valid but I think it's a step too far to be like never read this book burn it get rid of it because I think this was was beautiful and one of the best books I've ever read in my life and that doesn't mean to say that I'm gonna go around recommending it to people because I agree I don't think this is a book you would go and recommend to someone this is a book that you have to like think about reading and making sure that you are going to be okay reading it definitely there's some books out there that you just need to be aware of what you're going into the same with any any media anything that you consume you have to know yourself and what you can handle if something isn't something you can handle does that mean it shouldn't exist or no one else should have it no. <laughs> so for me personally, this was just excellent. I knocked like half a star off it because like I've heard that the author wrote this book with the intention of making the reader sad. And I felt like there were points through the book where I felt that intention. And I don't know if some of the things that were included were necessary necessary to include if it weren't been for that intention of the author. And I don't know if that is something I agree with personally. If it's something is sad in a book, that's fine, but I want there to be like a point to it, you know? But 
I really did love this. The next book I read was Fragile Animals by Genevieve Jagger, which I actually read through NetGalley. The publisher 404 Inc. let me get access to this book early. So thank you so much to NetGalley and 404 Inc. for that. And I gave this book four stars. This book is about a woman who is an ex-Catholic who had a really strained, difficult relationship with her mother growing up. And she has gone away to the Isle of Bute in Scotland for a holiday and she meets a man at the inn she is staying with who claims to be a vampire. And the book kind of follows the relationship that unfolds between them in which they kind of confess to each other all of the blasphemous things they've done throughout their lives. Whilst at the same time we're getting glimpses back into her past and what happened with her family and why she and her father are no longer Catholic, what her mother did, where her mother is. And I thought this book was really, really interesting. I don't know if it's because of my upbringing, because I was brought up in a, not a Catholic family, but a family that was quite involved in the church. And I don't go to church anymore. So I think this topic matter is just very interesting to me in general. But I really liked the writing style of this book, the atmosphere. I love that it was set in Scotland. I mean, that always helps in my case. My favourite part about this book, I think, was Jagger's take on the vampire as a supernatural being. We're like drowning in vampire content since like Buffy and Twilight and Vampire Diaries. There's like endless vampire content out there where the vampire is made to be like bad boy, sexy, like seductive, sultry. But in this book, the guy is not any of that. He's kind of just like a normal guy, kind of dirty and gross sometimes. And he's kind of written in a way it's like he's kind of decaying, which I thought was so interesting because obviously vampires are corpses. So why are we making them sexy all the time? I mean, don't get me wrong, I love that. But also I just thought this was a really interesting way to kind of subvert, subvert the expectations of what we see as a vampire because they are walking corpses. So they would, they would be quite gross. Um, that's what I really liked about <laughs> this book. I just think that it also had some really interesting discussions on religion, obviously, and I love a relationship between a mother and daughter that is conflicted and strained and weird. I just think that dynamic is so interesting and I love reading about it. So yeah, this book comes out on the 25th of April. I would recommend if you like a, a Supernatural, go read this because it's a Scottish book. We have to support Scottish literature. The next book I read was another four star and that is Good Girl, Bad Girl by Michael Robotham. This is the first book in a thriller series where we're following a forensic psychologist, Cyrus Haven, and a girl he meets called Eva McCormack who has had a troubling past. Basically she was found hiding in a secret room in a flat where she had been living with a corpse for months. And we see Cyrus meet Evie and Cyrus has his own trauma that he's dealing with because basically all of his family died when he was younger in a really horrific way. So we've got their relationship in this book um, forming. Meanwhile, Cyrus is trying to solve the case of a figure skating champion teenager who has been murdered and his relationship with Evie ends up being an asset to him with this because Evie has a unique gift that she is able to tell whenever anyone is lying. It was very classic detective thrillery to me. It felt like watching a BBC crime show like Line of Duty or whatever. I really love Cyrus and Evie as characters. I think their backgrounds are so interesting to read about and because this is the first book in a series I think there's two other books out. We have so much more to learn about them as characters. Like we aren't given the full story of what has happened really, especially to Evie. <laughs> so I am so excited to get my hands on the second and third installments in this series. I was more interested in their 
stories and their backgrounds than I was in the main crime of this novel of the murder of the figure skating champion which is probably why this didn't get five stars because I think that the, the main crime in a story should be the most engaging and interesting part probably but if you're looking for a really fun crime thriller detective novel I would say definitely get your hands on this um, especially because there's two other books so you can really dive into this world as soon as I am able to I'm going to get these the rest of the series I loved it the next book I read was a short one and it's a bit different because it's a collection of short stories and this is Folk by Zoe Gilbert this I got as a blind book at Toppings bookshop in Bath and what a good blind book to get this was so up my street. I gave it 3.5 stars, so not my favourite read of the month, but I also think that's fair with a short story collection. A five star short story collection would mean that every short story was five stars for you, right? And that's difficult <laughs> to accomplish. But the cool thing about this collection is that all of these short stories in it are intertwined with each other and they all take place in this imaginary fantasy island called Neverness where the blurb says the villagers lives are entwined with nature its enchantments seductions and dangers it's very kind of horror in a kind of Angela Carter way. Each short story is kind of written like as a, a dark fairy tale but what I especially like about it is that if you read the short stories in the order they come, which I think most people would is what I did, you start off with a specific um, event that takes place every year on the island for children of a certain age group and you follow the children who are part of this age group throughout the short stories like they're always popping up sometimes they're the main characters sometimes in the background and you're following them throughout their childhood teenagers adults different things that happen in their lives and then at the end the last short story it takes place the same event but the children in it are their children now so we've reached their adulthood and I just thought that was a cool way of starting and finishing it and I also like the fact that each short story kind of refers back to an event in like a small way that you've read about in a previous short story so it really does feel like it kind of immerses you in the world in that way. It's definitely one that I think I'll be rereading because I think there'll be so much more detail I'll pick up on a second read. I really liked Verlin's Blessings and I really liked A Winter Guest as well. A Winter Guest was kind of the lightest one for me I think. It's such a good short story collection I really really liked it. And then finally the last book I read in March was My Tender Matador by Pedro Lamebel, which I chose to read for the Storygraph Reads the World challenge. This is the first book I'm reading for the challenge in which they've listed 10 countries and the goal is for you to read a book written by an author from that country and the book also set partially or mostly in that country. So I did some research and I decided to read this book. And this is set in 1986, whilst Augusto Pinochet was in charge of Chile and leads up to an attempt on Pinochet's life that took place in 1986. But it mainly follows a drag queen who is known as the Queen of the Corner in the neighbourhood that she lives in, in Santiago, and her relationship with a young man who befriends her and she starts letting him and his friends use her flat for meetings and to store strange boxes in and it's basically revealed that they are part of the rebellion against Pinochet. I um, have very little knowledge on kind of the history of Chile. So I was going into this very blind. I didn't really know anything about Pinochet as a leader. Um, I got a really helpful comment from Francesca who basically said that Pinochet took over the country in 1973 because Chile was going to become Cuba. The people of Chile demanded the military take over and so they did, but the problem was that Pinochet overstayed his welcome. That 
comment was so helpful for me for contextualizing before going into this book and um, so thank you so much to Francesca for telling me that. I will say though this book was very good at giving you enough information so that if you are like me and going in with such little knowledge about the events and about like the political context I th I feel like the book does contextualize it for you enough in a way that's not like boring or overwhelming but it really situates you in this time and place. It's quite interesting because whilst most of our time is spent in the perspective of the Queen of the Corner it does cut away to Pinochet as well and so he is a main character in the book and what his was a life was like leading up to the the attack on him, his relationship with his wife a little bit. We're kind of seeing the two sides of what was leading up to this event. I went into this quite like just unsure whether I was going to enjoy it. The The good thing about the challenge that I'm doing is that it's kind of like forcing me to go out of my comfort zone of reads. It's forcing me to make sure that I'm not reading books solely set in places I'm familiar with and cultures I'm familiar with, which is always good. But it also means that I am going to be taking chances on books that I might not enjoy. So I was nervous, but I really, really loved it. I loved the writing style. I think I read this in maybe like a day and a half. It was short, which I think made it so that every page was there for a reason, there was always something important happening. The main thing I loved about it though was the character, the Queen of the Corner. She was so funny but also so heartbreaking. Her relationship with the young man who she befriends and falls in love with was beautiful, really really beautiful. And it was really interesting to read about a history that I had no prior knowledge on. I feel so happy that I enjoyed this as a book but I also feel like I actually learned and something and grew as a person. I will say that there are quite a lot of slurs throughout this book, mainly spoken by the Queen of the Corner, but it is quite frequent which was quite shocking so if that's something you'll be sensitive to, just be aware of that. And I also will say that I think it, w it only got four stars for me because the ending of it was quite abrupt. So I didn't know where I felt like I was left with at the end of it. I felt like I needed a bit more closure for me with this character, but it was really, really great, really fantastic. And that's that. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you had an amazing March. I hope you read a lot of good books and you had a good Easter break if you had one. What a time. So many, so many good books. I hope you have an amazing upcoming week and I will see you in the next one. Bye!